new um, park there. I know that the, the new uh, playground there. So I know that's not our land, but it's still pretty exciting to see that. And so I know some people have questioned about what the hell they're doing there, um, but it's a new playground. And so that's great. Okay, so Dave, do you wanna go next? Uh, sure, I've just, yeah, I, I know you've got a pretty full agenda and Erin always has her, um, her PowerPoint. Yeah, just a quick look, a couple of updates. Um, I know that Beth is, Beth Wilson from DPW is gonna join us later, is that correct, Erin? Um, yes. To talk about the Faring Brook project and um, uh, their upcoming, or our, the town's up, uh, uh, anticipated notice of intent for the floodplain restoration project along the Fearing Brook. So that's really, really pretty exciting that that is getting going. And I'm sure Beth will have more information for us tonight is, is just really an informal discussion. Um, but that's exciting to, uh, to anticipate um, the work. I believe we would be, the town would be putting that out to bid in the late spring, hopefully with construction starting in the early fall of 21 of later this year. So that's exciting. Um, probably at your next meeting, I will be giving you an overview. Uh, Pete Westover, the former conservation director for Amherst, has been working with a couple of landowners uh, in North Amherst, up near Atkins Reservoir, off of like Flat Hills Road, that area, um, on a couple of conservation restrictions that some, um, some residents uh, are, are willing to donate to the town. So, um, uh, these these uh, dovetail nicely with some of the land that we've purchased up there for conservation purposes. It would come at the conservation uh, restrictions would come at no cost to the town. Um, so I will provide um, you with those maps and we'll work probably at that point through Stephanie and we'll get you those maps prior to your next meeting. The other thing that is is on our agenda tonight um, in your packet is uh, the assignment of conservation restriction. And I'm not sure if any of you had a chance. This is a fairly simple administrative matter. Um, uh, the long and short of it is um, the, we are a co-holder, the town through the Conservation Commission is a co-holder of conserva a conservation restriction in the town of Amherst. Um, those conservation restrictions were formally held by the Valley Land Fund and the town of Amherst. Uh, the Valley Land Fund no longer exists. They were purchased, excuse me, they were merged with the Kestrel Trust. So in essence, um, uh, they are asking for a signature from Brett uh, to uh, basically uh, formalize that process that Kestrel would now be the, the co-holder of that conservation restriction. So it's a fairly uh, simple uh, administrative matter. The uh, conservation restriction does not change uh, in any way, shape or form. It simply is transferred formally legally over to the Kestrel Trust. So perhaps we can, when we have a break in the action later, we can talk a little bit more about that. And, and if you have any questions, we can, we can go into more detail. But I, I think those are the only updates I have. Um, we are continuing to do field work out there. If you've been out hiking, as I have been, at least prior to the snow, there is a tremendous, still a tremendous amount of activity out on the trails. I was at Wentworth Farm the other day on Sunday, and I was just blown away by the, the foot traffic. Um, people running, walking dogs, family groups, uh, social distance groups, um, skating, ice fishing. Um, it's It's really impressive. I mean, I I don't think in my career with a town I've ever seen our trails used more than in this pandemic year. So that's a real positive that people have all of this space to explore and be safe in. So um, that's really exciting. Brad continues to do, um, he has been uh, brush hogging um, uh, as much as he can right up until this last snowstorm uh, yesterday. So he's actually kind of getting caught up in some areas that we could never brush hog before uh, because they're so wet and the ground is solid. So that's actually a good thing, um, you know, um, uh, in terms of um, reptiles and amphibians, they're all uh, hibernating for the winter. So um, it's kind of nice to get some of these, uh, this old uh, early successional habitat uh, in good shape for the, for the spring. So. Hey, hey Dave, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, as we go forward into the spring, 
anticipating that that traffic is not going to slow down and will in fact speed increase. Um, is there a way that we can kind of be a little bit more proactive around information um, with responsible trail use as we go into mud season and as we get into kind of the, the times when the trails might be a little bit more sensitive to more use than they're used to? The word use was said a lot. But I'm curious yeah. if there's like, I don't know, I, and I, I'm coming to you with a problem and not a solution, which isn't what I love to do, but I, I'm wondering if there's a way about signage of, you know, yeah, trail no, maybe, uh, yeah working with Brianna, uh, uh, who does most of our social media. Yeah, no, that's a good idea because we certainly still are going to be messaging social distancing. Right. I'm anticipating the town manager will want to talk about Puffer Spond again this year. We had such a, I think, successful year doing um, outreach and, and uh, um, safety outreach at Puffer Spond. I think that'll probably be in place again this year. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. One of the things I, one of the the downsides of all this use is I am finding a tremendous amount of waste along the trails, um, plastic waste, masks, things of that sort. So uh, Brad's got his work cut out for him there. I will also say that Stephanie, um, uh, speaking of, of Brad and our field staff, uh, Stephanie is one of the members of the search committee for the assistant land manager position. Um, and we had a tremendous response this year, almost 50 applicants. That probably doesn't surprise most people given the the economy and the uh, you know employment rates, but almost 50 applicants and the search process is well underway and uh, interviews are beginning. So uh, we, we hope to have, I would say probably by the end of February, my goal would be to have hired an assistant land manager and get some help for Brad out there. Lots of trees still down. You've probably seen them all over. Um, Brad has done a nice job uh, trying to clean some of those up at Larch Hill and some of the other spots, but there's still, my guess is there's still probably 50, 50 to 65 down trees over trails all over town. So we'll get caught up on those as soon as we have some, some additional help. Yeah, and feeding off of what Anna was saying, the other place that there's obviously a lot of um, consternation just related to parking, but I don't know, that's an ongoing thing. Uh, I mean, like amethyst gets disgusting sometimes. Yeah, I was by there the other day and I was just, you could not fit a smart car in that parking lot. I mean, it was, it was just packed. Um, yeah, they're parking along the road and yeah, all sorts yeah, of- Yeah, I think it's places. just the unprecedented, um, you know, use. It, it's just, it's just wild how many people want to be out there and it's, it's an outlet that they feel is safe and, and we want to encourage them, but they do need to be careful. I found out on Bay Road, some of the access points to our land in the, the Mount Holyoke Range on Bay Road, people just pulling over by the side of the road and parking where they can. So we need to use some care and caution, but that, that could go along with your suggestions on about just being smart about where you park and you don't want to get towed because some of those places are not safe. So thanks. And I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Dave. So um, John Root is um, is going to be presenting like a five minute um, presentation on a proposal at um, the Hitchcock Center. So I'm going to go ahead and promote him to panelists. And I believe Felix is also um, going to be it's John, it's Felix, right? Who's who's yes. presenting with you? Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. And I, I'll promote him to panelist as well. Right. And then you guys can take it away. Uh, so I, I think I'd like Felix to to start out. Um, he has a. Uh, can you share a presentation? Mm -hmm. Yep. And John, if you and Felix can also just introduce yourselves very briefly, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, John Root. I've started a, a group called Amherst Area Friends of Pollinators, and we've already begun work uh, with uh, supervision of the uh, of the town of uh, uh, re renovating the uh, the pollinator gardens at the old Hitchcock Center in Larch Hill area. Uh, and there are a couple of different um, uh, areas. One, uh, uh, the gardens surrounding the building, and there's another uh, large tract um, south of the building that we uh, had started to do some selective clearing from and some planting as well. And, uh, and Felix has, has been uh, 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 proposing a community orchard in that, uh, in that same tract of land. 
Sure, can can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, yep, yeah. uh, so teaming up with John here as part of a uh, area 501c3, Help Yourself, and we essentially promote um, and plant public access community orchards of varying size from little isolated trees to, to dozens of trees. And the, um, there's some good potential over at Larch Hill. So we are proposing a, a community access orchard of mixed species, um, something like six to, six to 10 trees uh, that <clears throat> we'd ideally plant this spring. And then as they come to term, uh, folks from the community can harvest from them. And uh, we would, you know, maintain them with our volunteer pool and plant them with companion plants and all of these, in addition to the number of pollinator plants that we'd hope to plant, will, uh, in addition to supporting us people and humans, uh, support pollinators and other wildlife as well. Thank you. There, um, this file has that map in there, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the pollinator garden. I don't know if this is separate from um, the other area or is this, uh, oh, here we go. I see, planting area one. Right, there was a f even a former kind of derelict pollinator garden that right now is would fall under the yellow kind of dotted rectangle. And then what we're proposing sort of revamps that, add some fruit trees all in area one and then if that goes well, uh, there was definitely room to the south that both of us were interested in planting after our pilot project was deemed to be successful. And just to understand where this is, this is the is that the trail on the left coming from the parking area down um, into mm -hmm. the Hitchcock or into Larch Hill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Felix and John, maybe I could jump in here. I've had a couple of meetings with with uh, John and and at least one meeting with Felix out there and Brad Borderweek as well. And um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very supportive of of um, you know kind of a pilot uh, program out there. John has been great. He's been, as he mentioned, he's been uh, working to try to bring back some of the lovely gardens that were part of the uh, Hitchcock Center, the former Hitchcock Center site around the building. And as we looked at the site, we really uh, kind of zeroed in on planting area one as a logical spot for kind of a first phase of, of the work that John and Felix proposed. I had, I had recommended that we not uh, do anything in what's called the construction area. Um, I think in large part, because we really don't know what, what the fate of the old Hitchcock Center building is gonna be. And I really didn't want John and Felix and other volunteers to uh, expend a lot of time, energy, and perhaps money planting there if that at some point, if that building comes down, there'll certainly need to be an area around it for demolition, et cetera, et cetera. We just don't know the, the fate of that building yet. So it made sense to try to do something here. It's a, it's a prominent conservation area. It's an area that has been lawn or open um, for off and on for a long, long time. It has recently, since John and Felix and I were out there, uh, fairly recently has been impacted by the, uh, the blowdown of two very large white pines. So it's, um, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit challenging right now. I know Brad has a plan for those white pines and, and I'm supposed to talk with him about that tomorrow afternoon. So um, it's, a, it's a, a spruce and a pine. The, the spruce <laughs> fell, fell towards the, the building and that's the one that, it, that's in the way. The, the pine doesn't necessarily need, need to be dealt with uh, now, that, now that you've cleared the trail. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to comment in the planting area one, um, the northern part of that area is where there's uh, a, an old um, uh, garden bed, a fairly, fairly sizable garden bed uh, that, that's been, that was overrun. And we did quite a bit of clearing of that, you know, taking out brambles. And uh, there's also a lot of goldenrod that kind of takes over there. And, 
but there's some there, there's some really pretty high value pollinator plants already established there. Um, so uh, I think it makes sense to to continue with that project as well as the. Um, uh, so I, I just wanted to, to suggest that perhaps we could look at planting area as uh, uh, the northern half and the southern half planting area one and, and even uh, considered planting area two moving into that somewhat with the um, uh, with, with the uh, community orchard if we want to uh, if you want to follow uh, my suggestion of uh, maintaining that uh, pollinator garden as, as a garden and rather rather than having that uh, be transformed into part of the uh, community orchard again uh, this is an area that has adequate parking it has a trail right next door um, it's fairly central to you know near downtown um, and it gets a, a fairly a fairly high amount of traffic foot traffic and and uh, of course, dog walking and, and joggers run through there. And I think it's part of the larger area of Bramble Hill, um, which over the past 10 years have, has really increased in terms of uh, visitorship there. So it seemed like a logical first step and, and John and Felix um, you know, have presented a, a, what I think is a reasonable starting point. So um, a couple of comments or questions. I mean, one, uh, this sounds great. Um, so a lot of good stuff going on here. Are there going to be any negative consequences to native plants that are already established there? Or are you going to do your best to maintain and enhance those? We're looking mostly at lawn. Okay. Where, where the community orchard is going to be. Okay. And that we don't need any more of. So, okay. Um, and in regards, so I noticed that you are planning on native pollinator plants, which is great. Uh, what about the, the trees that you're planning on? I assume that it looks like some of those are non-native. Have you thought about concentrating more on native trees or am I missing something? Uh, we have, um, certainly some of them are the beach palms, the Juneberry, Aronia, pawpaw, persimmon, that kind of stuff. We're limited a little bit by space. Um, Though it's though it's generous, uh, and thus we, uh, as we actually do, in our other, in most of our planting projects, focus on semi-dwarf uh, sized stock uh, tree stock, and and um, some of the native fruits are a little bit on the bigger side tree wise, and. Uh, you know, we, we could only squeeze one or two of them in there. Uh, in, 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 instead, we could do uh, a good dozen or so of these semi-dwarf ones. And then we'll definitely in include what native berry bushes we can, as well as the pawpaws, which I'm quite a fan of. Um, regarding the, the sort of obviously non-native ones, the peach, Asian pear, and apples, those are not really dispersive if we're thinking about like their impact into the larger um, ecosystem. They feed pollinators native and introduced alike and are really um, user-friendly, easy to identify, easy to get excited about in terms of the public. Uh, there's a little bit of sort of um, uh, it can be a little challenging to excite people about some of the more obscure and potentially bitter, like or, or sour, uh, native berries. So it's good to have some crowd pleasers in there. And um, uh, at the same time, we've we you know we recognize the importance of native. So we we definitely like a mix. Mm -hmm. And we were told that there might be some possibility of having some educational signage. So should that ever transpire, we can, um, we're also looking at this site as a teaching space and including all sorts of fun, empowering, inspiring ecology tidbits that absolutely will touch on uh, the sort of complex um, issues of native and introduced plants and, and food plants and where they fit into that. And so hopefully the real, uh, the real benefits of this site are, are, I'm imagining, the human takeaway and the passers-by and the users of the space, the, the folks who walk the trail, walk their dogs, who see this sort of diverse planting site uh, as, as part of a sort of common ecosystem that they're part of and, and participate in and by 
harvesting from it and learning about it and, and maybe volunteering, they sort of uh, are nurtured in their sense of connection with the land and, and maybe inspired to do something in their own backyard or garden or something like that. that so hopefully the, the impacts will be of this site will be beyond this smaller kind of modest geography. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Aaron and Dave, or I should first say, are there other commissioners who have thoughts or comments on this? Yeah. Um, so then for Aaron and Dave, is this more just for, what are we trying to do tonight? So, I mean, this is great. Uh, I think there's a lot of positive things here. Obviously, you know, it's gonna be a lot of work and gonna be some monitoring. I'm sure things will change. But are you, is this more informational? Are you looking for a vote tonight? I, I would like a vote. Um, I think, you know, I, I think we're staff are supportive of, of um, moving in this direction. I think the logical next step would probably be if the commission is favorable to moving forward is, you know, as we move into uh, February, um, we could work on kind of an MOU with, with John and Felix and whether it's a, a group or, or, or just the two of them, we could work on kind of an MOU, just a simple MOU that kind of outlines the parameters, the area, we'd have a map um, and any of the, you know, expectations as you just uh, elaborated on um, Brett, you know, the, the preference for as many natives as possible and, and the general area. And so that's, I think what we're looking for. And then, um, you know, as, as the weather turns a little bit, we could also uh, mark out the areas so that if commission members are there, I did commit to John and Felix that I would find some money for signs. So I, I think I can, I can find some money for um, some signs somewhere in the budget. So um, I'm committed to doing that. And as far as um, maintenance of this area is concerned, I assume that it's gonna be no chemicals, none of that sort of stuff. I mean, obviously this is all for pollinators. So, you know, it's gonna be very pollinator friendly. So, okay. okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, is there anybody from the public? So if there's anybody from the public who has a comment, you can use a little raise hand icon. Okay, if not, I think we are looking for a motion um, for us to support uh, the public orchard and pollinator garden at Larch Hill. I move that the Conservation Commission support the pollinator garden and orchard at Larch Hill. Second. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, voice vote. And just to be clear, since we only have four commissioners tonight, all four of us have to vote in favor of something. Otherwise, it's not going to pass. Uh, I don't think this one's contentious, but who knows where we'll end up later. So Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. And I for me as well. So we are good, Dave. And John and Felix, good luck. Uh, sounds great. And I look forward to visiting in the future. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks, Dave. Okay. So, um, Aaron, should we move on to our 7.30? Or do you want to cover something else first? Um, no, I think I think we should probably just jump jump right into it by the time we get our attendees into the meeting and plans pulled up. It'll probably be 7.30. Okay, so uh, I'm not a co-host, so I can't, like, let people in or oh. out. Let me let me appoint you a co-host just in okay. case. We... So I think Meredith is here. Meredith, is there anybody else here with you tonight presenting on this? Um, hi everybody. Uh, Joseph, Emuwa might be coming zooming in. Um, not sure if he. Is Doesn't there look yet. like it. We have a Brian Beck and a Mary Anderson. So. I don't know those folks. Okay. I might um, just be by myself. So why don't we get moving? And so this is a continuation of a notice of intent for 84 East Levitt Road. And I know that there's been a little bit of back and forth. And so Meredith, you, you can just briefly introduce yourself again and then give us an update about where we're at. Okay. Hi, yeah, I'm Meredith Bornstein. I'm working for myself under Divine Wetlands Consulting. My The applicant is Joseph Amua. He's the um, engineer and contractor 
on this project. It's a single family home on um, a lot that was created off of 84 East Levert Road. And I, we were here a couple of weeks ago, just going over that. Um, you know, the driveway, so it's across the street from Cushman Brook, the driveway is the only area of impact in, um, and that's in the outer 200 foot riverfront area. And we've had some back and forth. We had some good feedback from the neighbors and Aaron, and we um, updated the plans with some of your comments. So I can go through those if you'd like. All right, yeah. I'll just share my screen. We now have three sheets and they just got stamped. So now everything I've sent you, Aaron, you just throw away because we're gonna have okay. new, new sheets. So hang on okay. one second. Um, new sheets that are stamped. Okay, so can everyone see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so one thing that came up last meeting was there was a question about the location of the riverfront area and was that based off of actual flagging? And yes, it was, we just, we didn't have the mean annual high water um, flags shown. So now see these little green, it says MHW, that's mean, mean annual high. And those are the flags, that's Cushman Brook. Um, so then you see that the, then those were from the surveyor from when you guys approved the delineation, he just brought them into this plan. So these are surveyed and then the lines here indicate the 200 foot riverfront area and then the 100 foot riverfront area. And then to orient you, um, this is the, there's an existing barn house and another house dwelling here. Um, and so North, uh, I should zoom out. I'm sorry, I jumped right into plan changes. Um, so this is East Levert Road. And then there's an existing driveway here, which we're gonna be utilizing. Um, but during construction, that's gonna be a gravel wash rack so that trucks going in and out don't track mud into the street. So, okay, so the stream flags were one thing that we've added. Um, the, we added a riverfront mitigation area. This is this square right here, um, 1300 square feet. And that's to compensate for this, um, the driveway, which is in the riverfront. So um, we're proposing to plant 36 shrubs. And I just put a list on here because I wasn't sure what was gonna be, be available. Um, I got the plants, Aaron sent me a really nice document of um, it was like pollinators, poll shrubs that are good for pollinators. So these all have flowers at some point, um, high bush blueberry, New Jersey tea, shad bush, raspberry, um, dogwood, and or choke cherry. So I was thinking based on availability, they would choose a smattering of these, of these plants. Um, another comment that came up was, how are they gonna make sure they're not gonna mow this area? So we added boulders to the edge. So that area can be marked permanently. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, okay. So a question came up about the driveway being, um, had to be 12 feet wide because of a zoning bylaw. So we did update the plan. First we had it 13 feet wide and that was a little too big. And then we made it 10 feet and it turns out that's too small for zoning. So the happy medium is gonna be 12 feet wide. And um, so that still gets us under 10% of the riverfront area on this, prop, on this parcel. So we're still meeting performance standards for riverfront area and the zoning bylaw. Um, we had talked about doing a grass swale and I didn't realize this before, but the driveway is going to be a cut. So we have, we have a little cross section. Oh, sorry, it's on this one. Um, the driveway is going to be a what? It's going to be a cut 
Oh, a cut. A okay. cut, sorry, yeah. So there won't be this, it's gonna be a little bit of a, slot, a side slope and then a 12 foot wide drive, paved driveway. So it, we can't have a grass swale adjacent to the, um, the driveway. So um, Meredith, I'm just gonna jump in here on a couple yeah. things that you're mentioning. Um, just before I forget, because of the change in the driveway width, I'm gonna need to see um, a revised application form that has the revised riverfront numbers and proposed alteration numbers. Okay. Um, and then the restoration area included in there with as a replacement. And then I guess for this, what I'm wondering is, so you're just envisioning that this is a sheet flow down this driveway. You don't, you're not concerned about that becoming, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no swale on either side of this driveway to capture water. Yeah, so I think, it. so it would just be sheet flow from the driveway alone because I forgot to add this other, so all the roof drainage is going to be directed to the north. I'm going to change plans. Um, let me see where which sheet is on here. Uh, um, uh, hang on one second. Oh yeah, this is yeah, this is it. Um, where? Here we go. Oh, not that plan. I'm sorry. So we added, here we go, um, roof drains to take the runoff when it rains from the house and direct it over here. So I guess I'm envisioning clean, just rainwater going down the driveway. Um, so what's going to happen in the winter with snow storage? I mean, how... Um, I mean, there's no place to push snow on either side of the driveway because it's going to be inside of a like a embankment on either side and there's no swale on either side to provide any kind of storage of any sort for water or anything like that. I just envision this becoming like, a, a, I mean, it's not a conservation issue, but I'm just wondering, I mean, yeah, or I guess, is the snow going to be taken off site? That seems like a plow truck wouldn't do that. I don't right. know. Well, I would envision they would just, I mean, I'm not a plow person, but they would plow it and plow it up here where it's going to be flat. Um, uh, is that flat though? Isn't that a hillside? It's well, going to be house carved is, into? The house will be, the, the area up here will be leveled out. Okay. Um, and yeah, I should find out what, well, I guess now they have, like what these people do, they, um, it, their driveway's flat, flush with the, mm -hmm. um, it's not gonna be a steep embankment. Let me go back to the profile. So I'm not, it's not like a huge cut um, he's saying, I th I'm imagining it's just a, f uh, yeah, it's a one-to-one. -one, so that just should be a foot on either side. So I would think the snow would be able to just go on either side. You know, it's not like a six foot wide, a six foot tall slope or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, Sorry, this is my first time seeing at like actually being able to look at these plans because they just came in last night. So I'm um, just just thinking, you know, as we're looking at them. So yeah, I totally understand. And if you guys need more time to review, that's okay too, since we didn't get them in till last night. Erin, could I could I interject? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at that driveway and the and the and the design from a from a jurisdictional standpoint of the commission or just engineering standpoint, practic practically speaking? Because well, that's really up to the applicant, right? 
well, where, from a from a water standpoint, I guess it concerns me. Um, you know that it's going to be. Uh, I mean, so so here's what I see. Like, if if there's no way to get the snow off the driveway, then what's going to happen? It's going to turn into an ice sheet, and then what's going to happen? They're going to be out there with ice melt and sand and salt and everything else. And then when it washes down, it's going to go right into those catch basins at the bottom of the hill, and then right into the river. So, like, from a practicality standpoint, yeah, I'm like, it's it's ringing a bell for me. But like, it's more so like what the impact of that would be ultimately. Mm -hmm. be the you know because it's it does go up a slope that driveway and it's you know it's a pretty good pitch down to where the catch basins are so mm -hmm. and we do have conditions in our boilerplate about not using yes. certain types of ice melts and salts and things so I just trying to think about that now mm -hmm. present yeah uh, articulate because yeah I'm I'm glad I uh, maybe I can pull up some photos of the hill and see. I mean, it's not a it's a gradual hill, you know, it's not um, like a vertical slope. But I get that snow storage uh, could be an issue. Aaron, do you have any thoughts on alternatives? Well, I mean, I think having a small grassed swale on either side of the of the driveway is is always a good idea anyways. I mean, any any road driveway that you see that doesn't have some kind of country drainage built into it um, turns into an issue with water. Um, because there's nowhere for the water to go other than down the driveway. And in the wintertime, it's where what's going to happen is it's just ice. Um, and seeing as that's in a riverfront area, that's really kind of my big concern. Um, but I mean, <sighs> we, I mean, so we could say snow storage has to be up by the house. Um, you know, in, in the, the turnaround area. Yeah, um, here. Here. It does look like on one set of plans that the turnaround is within the 200 foot, but on the other set, it's outside of the 200 foot, that little turnaround pad up at the top. And it did kind of look like there was two separate configurations of that maybe. Yeah, that looks different than the other one. See, like the turnaround looks like it's partially within 200 feet there, but on the other plan, it's shown differently. Am I yeah, I the only one seeing that? Yeah, no, I mean, you're seeing it. I just, I think he was trying to maybe show something else. But do you, but do you see what I mean? The driveway footprint yeah. there with the turnaround is extending into the 200 foot versus on the other plan, it looks different it's shown outside of the 200 foot on the other plan that you were just toggling. Yeah, see, it's shown outside. It's like the riverfront line moved or the pad moved for where the driveway is going. Yeah, the pad looks a little different between the two of my. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a small difference, but it's, I mean, what's, what is the difference? I guess I'm wondering there. And in terms of snow storage, it does, you know, the other driveway is shown as bigger. I mean, it's outside of jurisdiction, but it's just a different configuration and bigger. And this one shows driveway. I think this is showing this, like the stairs going up to the second, the second level. Um, okay. Let me see, let me look at the other. Oh, I don't know. These are all different, and mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't do the plan, so I don't I don't know why they are. I think we're just trying to show different things in each um, on each sheet. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we would still be under the ten percent. So ten percent of the riverfront area on the property is sixteen hundred seventy feet. Um, so with a 12 foot driveway, we had 
um, 1200, about 1274. Um, so even if, okay, where's that other little thing was this little corner um, was in the riverfront loop, that's not gonna be 400 feet, 400 square feet. But it was my understanding that this was the ultimate, this was the layout because they want to pull into their garage and be able to turn around. And maybe we put on here, like snow storage has to go up here. Yeah. And yeah, then that's turn around. Thinking. Yeah, and you can't use that. I mean, they're going to have a garage, so they don't need to turn around. Well, you're not, your car's not going to be covered with snow. I don't know. I think that... But well, they can always push it off of the pavement too, I guess. So then it's on lawn and doesn't, um, so it has time to infiltrate. Before. Probably don't don't want it right next to their well though. Maybe they do. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, I mean that. I think de adding a designated snow storage area would be a, would be a good solution. Um, and also, as long as we condition the, you know, that they're aware that in that area that there's going to be restrictions on the types of things they can use for snow i mean for ice control on that driveway and meredith do you know why a so i see in the in the plan that there's a cut but do you know why it needs to be a cut and there can't be a swale there as well i think he's just based on the grades um but to brett's point could he Grade in a swale. That's so easy. cut, so angle it back and gentler slope, or have that steep cut wider out and then, you know, further out from the driveway and then make room. Yeah, I mean, I think these guys are all making excellent points because what I see happening here is water coming down that driveway, going on either side of the driveway, washing out gullies on either side of the driveway, and then you've got erosion kind of happening a, yeah i could see it as a water quality concern heading into cushman brook sedimentation um but i mean the degradation of the driveway mm -hmm. <laughs> and this water quality issue go hand in hand so it's probably to the best interest of the applicant to think about controlling erosion and, and allowing for slowing the velocity of water heading down that driveway mm -hmm. even if it was a narrow stone swale on either side or something to capture it because I mean I'm assuming it's not going to be perfectly flat it's probably going to be you know something like this where there's like a slight peak in the middle of the um of the driveway so water's going to sheet flow off on either side Um, yes, I think what we're asking for is if we can get some feedback from the engineer on what is feasible with the road, that'd be very helpful. And some alternatives and maybe there's something that we don't understand and it's not feasible, but it seems like there should be some possibility. And I would be surprised, Meredith, if, if, if that's not what the applicant was thinking of doing anyway. And the, and the standard, the section that they put in for the driveway is just kind of super duper standardized. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you say, really? No, no swale on the side? And he'll say, mm -hmm. oh yeah. You know, so we just need to see that because I think it, it would be pretty standard practice. Mm -hmm. Right. And Meredith, you said for the 12 foot wide driveway, the alteration was 1274 square feet. Yes, I think that's what I wrote down. Okay. We have a little chart. Where's my chart? Here we go. Yeah, just 12, 12 foot driveway. 12 foot, yeah, it's 1274. Okay. So maybe they was thinking he couldn't. Um, squeeze it in under the 10% riverfront area, but I don't, would that matter? Because it's a grass swale, it's not being paved. So that wouldn't count, right? Towards being a permanent impact. 
Um, I mean, if, if it was like a stone on either mm -hmm. side, I would say it would count, but if it's a natural vegetated swale, um, and, and what I would recommend is, I mean, what, what I think would function the best is something that's not just like a, a deep swale that somebody's, you know, going to drive into, but more like a, a very low grade, you know, very, um, low grade swale that kind of runs alongside the driveway that they could just grade in, um, to capture the water. And it would almost act as a water quality swale that they could just mow with their lawn mower if that's all being maintained as grass, as you know, lawn. Yeah. It's almost like the driveway <clears throat> needs to be shown as 14 feet, but just a swale on either side. Right. Rather than a slope. Would a one foot, no, that's not gonna work. Well, two foot wide grass whale on either side added to this cross section. And you would still have a side, a little bit of a side slope, but um, it won't be very, still gonna be a foot. So that's not tall. So that seems like a good solution. Yeah, and I mean, quite frankly, you could even put plantings, you know, if, if you, you could do grasses and plantings inside it um, that were, you know. Oh, rather than the mitigation area? Well, no, I'm saying. Um, or in addition? I mean, yeah, if you're calling it. It's, it's tricky because it's not a stormwater structure, right? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a benefit to the site. It's a benefit to the yeah. riverfront area. Um, but, but there are native grasses that are, you know, better than using just like a, like a standard grass mm -hmm. seed mix that you could put in there, like a, a conservation mix that would, you could mm -hmm. still mow, but that would provide some value and then, and some stabilization. Um, and I think that would be something I would look at as not being a adverse riverfront impact. It would be like a, you know, a water quality swale with some potential habitat value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would still be able to get, have a good amount of snow sitting on it throughout the winter. Yeah. Okay. I have, yeah, I get it. Great, I have a good report back. Well, I'll have to get Joseph to update the plan again. Um, was there anything else? I mean, does anybody have any comments on the planting area? That seems in line with what we talked about last time with the addition of the stones. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm zooming in, here we go. Yep, and that um, mix seems I'm fine. Just... Yep. Anything native and yeah, that's all great. I just want to um, go to my notes on the um, from the last meeting. Um, and we will open it up to the public in just a minute. So, and the the paver issue, um, I guess there was there was a concern that that wasn't going to work on the slope. Is that right, Meredith? Or getting plowed. Can you yeah. plow pavers? Um, I think there was a concern about that. Mm -hmm. And then maintenance as well. Yeah, and you can't, can't sand them, right? Oh, that's per, well, that's, yeah. you can sand pavers, probably not um, impervious. Yeah, you do have to use, I think, a, um, vacuum periodically like the vacuum truck sweeper on them periodically to keep them clean um but yeah i mean everything i have like um i mean i could do a little share screen but basically we were talking about downspouts directed on the north side of the house grading of the driveway to sheet flow north away from the property um the properties to the south and and so i mean my recommendation would be to keep that swale on the north side of the property to catch the flow, just to keep the water from being directed down the slope towards the neighbors. Um, but um, I think the main goal is to keep the water clean and to keep it on your property. Um, 
And then um, there was a concern about potentially if a groundwater seep was exposed in the course of construction, since there's a cut happening in that hillside, that if that comes about, that it's something that um, corrective action would have to be taken to address it. Um, there's a question about the stamp and obviously we've got a stamp on it and it's a it's an engineer stamp or a surveyor stamp yep it's an engineer civil engineer okay. Yep. perfect okay and then top of bank flags were added um pervious pavers i guess were ruled out as an option stones were added to demarcate the restoration area and that there's a note that it's um it'll be conditioned that it's undisturbed in perpetuity and then um, the riverfront flags, I think I already mentioned, were picked up. So those are the comments. And so it sounds like like most of the comments or all of the comments were addressed with the exception of that swale issue. Okay. So um, do any other commissioners have any comments? If not, I want to open up to the public real quick. Okay, so if there's anybody from the public who would like to comment or having Thing they'd like to add you can use the raise hand feature should i stop sharing or sorry sure okay i think we're good i didn't mean to talk so okay so i'm not seeing anything um so it sounds like meredith that there is some additional you know feedback that we would like particularly related to the swale so if you can get back in touch with um with aaron or with the town um that would be great. And then, yeah, hopefully next time we can move forward on this. Okay. Yeah. Great. I will update the plan again. Okay. And so, so the swale and snow storage too, just maybe oh, yeah. designate that snow storage area and Meredith, if it would be at all possible to get it, to get the revised plan by the 5th of February, okay. just so that we have a chance to review it in advance. That way we can be prepared to potentially approve it on the February 10th meeting. Got it. Yep. February that's 5th. Enough, that's enough time for you, Meredith? Oh, nice. yeah. We'll make it enough time. Okay. I'm not updating the plans, but I will. I'll put the order in. Sounds good. So, <laughs> Aaron, um, can you give us a time and date that we're looking for? Yep. So, February 10th at 7.40 p.m. Okay. okay. So, looking for a motion for continuation. Move to continue this hearing to February 10th at 7.40 p.m. Second. Thank you. So, Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I from me as well. So, we will see you then, Meredith. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Okay, um, so we are moving on to our 735, which is the Amherst College, but they have a request for continuation. And so are we looking for, what time are we looking for that one, Erin? Um, so that would be February 10th at 7.30 p.m. I have a point of order question. If I'm abstaining from this because I work for them, can we still do the things? Is, and abstain still counts? Mm -mm. No, so I can't vote on this one. Correct. But, but, but I, I think I think per open meeting law and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but one person could theoretically announce a continuation if there wasn't a quorum. I thought that I mean, was it gets okay. continued kind of either way. It's just whether or not we vote to do it or not. And we can't. So we can't vote to do it. So we just automatically do it. Well, I think that we might as well go ahead and vote. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of an administrative thing at this point and not much else that we can do so mm -hmm. um. i i know that we've in the past when like for example if there if we didn't have a quorum and this was like in a in a um open meeting venue like in a town hall that if the con if we knew there was no quorum and con con members didn't make it i would literally sit there and if anybody showed up i'd say the hearing has continued to this day at this time and that was sufficient but um, uh, yeah. yeah, it's not like we could vote on anything tonight anyway, so. Right, exactly. <laughs> That'd be even worse, so. Okay, so um, looking for a motion for, for a continuation from anybody but Anna. <laughs> uh, 
I move to continue the Amherst College hearing to February 10th. Is it 7.45, Aaron? 7.30. 7.30. I think you're the second, Jen. Seconded. <laughs> okay, so Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Uh, Anna? Dane? And I for me as well. So, okay. It's a little funny there, but uh, we're good. Okay, Aaron. Um, so, what would you like to move on to next? Um, so, if we could jump to Beth Wilson, I'll uh, make her. Um, promote her to panelists and she'll just do a brief presentation on the Faringbrook um, on the Faringbrook project for us. Hello Beth and you just have to hit the unmute button. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'll fix it. Couldn't see my picture before. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I'm using my kids uh, microphone and I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's like a handset that you have to hold. It's great. Yeah, you're a little soft, but we can hear you. Jen, all right, let me see if I can turn the volume up a little. All right, I'll just talk really loud. Um, how is everybody? Good? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, yeah, we're just, this is just an informal discussion for Fearing Brook. You all are pretty familiar with this project. I know um, Brett and Jen are, I'm not sure about Anna as much, but um, yeah, we are hoping to submit it for the hearing on the first meeting in March, if we can get to that point. But anyway, this is just sort of an informal discussion to get comments from you guys on the plan set so that I can make any changes in the next two weeks before submitting the application. Um, this is gonna be submitted as a ecological restoration limited project. Um, so, you know, a lot of the application is really going to be explaining what that means and meeting the thresholds of, of being that kind of a limited project. Today, I just wanted to go through the plan set and go through sort of the specifics of the design of the project with you and see if you have any comments on it. Um, so Aaron's got the plan set up. And yeah, so that's, that's the site. We can go to the next sheet. Yeah. So this sheet shows the limit of work. Um, there's a, an area on the south side of Fearing Brook, and then there's an area on the north side of um, Fearing Brook where there's gonna be work being done. This is the area where there's gonna be the floodplain restoration. This is gonna be a stormwater drainage improvement um, that's included in the project. Uh, but this is just a good view of where the project's gonna be and sort of the extent of the project. This area is about 40 feet by um, 450 feet. Um, and this is, I'm not sure the area, but this is basically, it's an area that doesn't drain very well. Um, this is Port River Elementary School, soccer field, softball field, um, low area that tends to hold a lot of water causing issues with the soccer field. And then what's happened is um, drainage during storm events has actually caused quite a bit of erosion on the bank of Fearing Brook. So we're including that in the project primarily because a preliminary review by DEP um, commented on the erosion of the bank there and wanted to see this included in the project. Um, but anyway, that's about all that that sheet really shows. So why don't we go to the next sheet? All right, so this sheet, on this sheet. <laughs> um, this is just existing conditions. Um, so there's not too much to really talk about on this sheet either. Next sheet. All right, so this sheet shows um, the area that's going to be cleared, which is this hatched area. This sheet shows the erosion control, which is going to come along all the edge here. The compost filter tube is proposed for that. Um, this sheet shows the stockpile area, which um, we've talked about is sort of flexible. That's going to be dependent a lot on where 
community gardens, parking, and, and what happens this summer. This, but there is going to be a stockpile area on the site. Tracking pad. Um, and this may be a good point to sort of talk about the progression of the project. Um, the idea would be that they would clear this area first. Um, they would put down erosion control. They would clear the area. Then any in-stream work they have to do, which there's some boulder clusters and some core log um, locations along the bank, that would all get done before they do any excavating of the floodplain area um, because vehicles are going to need to get across here to get in to do the uh, wet work. So that's kind of how the construction sequence is going to go. Then once the wet work is done, erosion control would get closed up again, and then they could start the um, actual excavating of the floodplain area, remove or removal of soil from the site, um, come back, grade topsoil, and do all the plantings um, and the seeding. So that's just sort of the sequence, and I thought this, this sheet shows that well. Um, so we can go to the next sheet, Karen. So this sheet shows the locations of the boulder clusters and the core logs. Um, and you can see here where the, the, the trail that we have down at Port River Farm right now is going to get moved a little bit to the south. It's going to get reconstructed, regraded, um, and then the grading lines for the floodplain project. Um, like I said, 40 feet wide. And you can look at the lines, but the, the, the depths, depending on the location along here, is generally zero to three feet of um, material is going to get removed. It's going to be about 2,000 cubic yards of soil total is uh, going to be removed from the site. And yeah, that's. Is it, the screen is really small on my screen, so I can't quite <laughs> see. Um, okay, next sheet. Oops, she's zooming in. Oh. Okay, so this sheet shows the work that's going to happen on the north bank, which is um, it's going to be a, a vegetated swale with a with a perforated pipe coming through. Um, Again, the swale at its widest is four feet or so. Um, and it's to, to try to get some of the ponding that's happening in this area to drain um, drain down into, it's gonna, it's gonna have an outfall and just to improve the drainage over there. And yeah. Is that a level spreader at the outlet there, Beth? Yeah. Okay. So, in general, there's a there's a stone pipe end to it, and mm -hmm. it's more of a of a basin, you know, a vegetated basin. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's about all I have about that right now. And this is the planting plan. There's uh, plenty of trees and shrubs. I think there's 12. Um, I can't see the numbers. Let me pull it up on mine. There's what 20 or so trees proposed, I believe. Um, a number of shrubs, um, and then and then general seeding uh, to really create this floodplain. So you know the idea is that to lower the bank, there'll still, there will still be a low level bank to keep the, the channel in place. There still will be a stream channel, um, but the bank on this side is, is obviously gonna be a lot lower than it is right now. So that during storm events, um, the water's gonna be able to flow into this area and, and slow down and the sediment's gonna settle and the, all the vegetation and the soil bacteria are gonna be able to really um, absorb 
the contaminants that are coming down, the, the, you know, the sediment itself, but also um, nutrients and bacteria that are in that storm water. That's the whole idea of the, of the floodplain creation. Um, and so these plantings are, are very important to the project. And when you're looking through the list, it's a nice list of um, wetland plants. And yeah, we're going right up to the edge of the Fort River. I think I forgot to mention earlier that when they are doing the in-stream wet work, um, there will be erosion control, you know, down at this end, protecting the Fort River. And we need to talk about that a little bit, but we are gonna pro propose something. Um, no, you said there's gonna be vehicles in the water? Yeah, I think we're asking the same question, sorry. Yeah. So the are they working in the wet or are you diverting flow bath? They're working in the wet just to place these boulder clusters. The proposed boulders are um, 24 inch diameter boulders. So they're, so they're, they're big. And so I'm assuming um, that some kind of a vehicle is gonna have to get down there, be it just a, a, a backhoe or something to carry those rocks down there. Um, so, so I'm gonna have, you know, we're gonna have them do that before they start excavating in here, just to try to limit, um, and you know, limit, limit erosion and destruction of the area. Uh, but it's really just placing those those rock clusters, and there's there's three of them, and building up the core logs. They have um, they have like a rock toe to them, the core logs, but th those boulders are, are smaller than these boulders are. But there is just a little bit of work in the stream and right on, on the bank um, that should happen basically before they start doing any, any of the excavating. So I guess to follow up on Jen's question, is there gonna be some, something actually in um, Faring Brook to like a turbidity curtain or something to prevent sediment that's stirred up from getting into the fort? Yeah, I'd like to see something like that right, right down at the, you know, the end closer to the Fort River. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean, it depends on the time of work, right? Mm -hmm. So when they get to do this project, if it's a low flow season, it might not be an issue, but sometimes on projects like this, you'll see like a little bit of like a, like a natural stone dam just to divert flow onto the far bank while mm -hmm. they place those boulders. Mm -hmm. Um, it's pretty yeah. unusual that they would just like be on the bank with an excavator and they, they're going to want to be in the dry to place those boulder clusters. I know mm -hmm. they are. <laughs> so it's just a matter of like where, how you do redirect flow during that time, I think. Yeah. Um, well, we will be doing it. Uh, the expected date is starting September. So September to November ish. So mm -hmm. it is definitely low flow. Um, again, throughout the, this plan set, there's a number of discussions written in about um, being aware of, of the weather that's coming up and taking all precautions uh, for, for erosion. Um, but, you know, if the water is high enough, they may just not be able to put the boulder clusters in at that time. I've, if you go out to Fairingbrook, there are some days when the, 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 low, the flow is pretty low. Um, but. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it roaring and I've seen it trickling. It's it really flat. depends. Yeah. System. Very flashy. Yeah. I, I yeah, I I'm surprised they don't want to put something on the SNEC plan just showing how they're going to divert the flow when they're placing the boulder clusters. They probably have thought about it. I don't see it on the plans. They're also really hard to get to load on my computer, so it's possible it's in one of the notes and I just literally can't see it. But mm -hmm. It might be worth mentioning to them. I'm sure they've thought about it. Yeah, no, it's definitely not in the plan set, but it is okay. something we can talk more about and, and I can, we can, you know, we can include something about, you know, but obviously we'll be accessing from this side. So if, if there is a way, and I'm sure there is, that we can, you know, divert the flow sort of around where the boulder clusters are generally going to be placed centrally in the stream channel, we can divert the water around those those few areas while we're doing it. Right. And the other thing is they might have a note in there that says like they'll, you know, probably the on-site engineer is going to make a call about where they put the boulder clusters. So maybe they'll 
part, being able to work in the dry will be part of that decision too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Those are things. Yeah. We should talk, talk a little bit more about that and have, have that figured out by the time we come to our hearing. Um, all right. Next slide. This slide is really uh, shows all the resource areas. Um, so it's got Riverfront on it. It's got um, BLSF on it. It's got the buffer zone lines on it, and it's got the impact vol- uh, quantities on it too. Which again, it's so small I can't really see. But so these are impact numbers for BLSF and Riverfront. And again, because it's a limited project, you know, we are we are allowed to to hit some of these higher numbers. <laughs> um, one thing this reminds me of is that just if you're if people are thinking of other uh, permitting that had to be done, um, we're not hitting any of the MEPA thresholds, so we're, we don't have to apply with MEPA. We're also not impacting over five thousand. Um, square feet of land underwater. So there's no water quality cert required. We are submitting to the Army Corps. Um, we're in the process of probably getting that done this week. So really the notice of intent and getting the notice of intent to natural heritage um, is, is the primary permitting. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but with the ecological restoration project, you actually have to submit to natural heritage before you submit the NOI to the CONCOM for sort of a preliminary review. So part of the NOI application that you guys will get will have that natural heritage preliminary review. That might be helpful. Um, Okay, next slide. And this slide um, just basically shows the planting plan again, but it shows where the cross sections are that are um, in the upcoming slides that, that we can look at. So, yeah, so these are the cross sections, sort of shows you at you know, different areas of the stream what's actually being excavated. Um, you can tell that the, the, the slopes change a little bit. Um, you know, right here, there's 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 still going to be more of a bank even after the project is done. There'll be more of a little edge of a, of a bank and, and the choir logs and the rock rock toes are also sort of meant to reinforce and create a little bit of a bank. Whereas at this cross section, you get more of a, of a slope and the water will more easily flow into the floodplain. Um, so those are all interesting. They show the... Um, 100 foot floodplain elevation, which is at, um, I think it's about 171 and a half or so is that elevation. Um, and so then you can see how that's that's all gonna change with the project. How not that's gonna change, but how we're gonna get um, good, good flow with even like the 10 year storm. Um, and yeah, and then this this is really just a site access construction slide. Um, we've already talked a bit about how speaking with property owners, abutting property owners may change a little bit of, of how this looks um, when the project actually happens. I know this gate's not going to be there. <laughs> um, and we may be accessing a little bit differently. But there certainly will be a construction pad. Um, and we will try and limit erosion. We're going to harden the road here, most likely. Harden this patch up to where the um, pavement start, or starts. I think it's more of a gravel parking lot there, but between the gravel parking lot and the limit of work is a grass area that we're going to have to access through. And so we're going to harden that up a bit. Um, and these are just the specs on the filter tube. So fence will probably go around the, the stockpile, soil stockpile area and the tracking pad. 
And those erosion control blankets would be on the on the bank until the veg gets established. Is that kind of? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and this just gets into the specifics about how to, it's, it's very detailed, it's, it's great mm -hmm. stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Gets into the details on how they're gonna lay out the boulder cluster clusters so that they're pointing in the right direction with water flowing in this direction with a, a point toe. Um, and yeah, it just gets into all of those details about how those things will be constructed. And this project will get, uh, it's going to get contracted out and um, we're looking for a environmental company similar to Malone and McGroom or somebody to be the oversight for the project. Um, so that's about it. So I'm really just looking for any comments that you all have. Uh, no comments, just an observation. Looks like we just lost Jen. So maybe she's coming back on. But um, or I was, actually, I do have comments, but um, that was. So um, I think that's really impressive, Beth. Uh, it looks like you guys have thought out a lot of details. Um, and yeah, the overall the, on the system should be really nice. We're hoping. I think it's going to be good. Yep. Well, major improvements. Brett, I had a couple of quick comments. One is that I've been in touch with um, Brian Yellen, who's a professor at UMass. Mm -hmm. And Brian is actually interested in kind of studying before and after. Um, I don't know the specifics, but he's considering seeking some grant funding. To, to kind of look at uh, before and after conditions uh, in this area, in the focus area that, that Beth just described. So I'm gonna be talking with him in the next couple of days and see, you know, kind of more specifics on that. But, you know, any data collection that we can do um, would be kind of interesting to see. Uh, and I think he wants to focus on water quality. The other thing I was gonna mention is Beth, we're, we're still uh, having conversations, Stephanie, who is coordinating uh, some of the farming activities at uh, Fort River Farm, Aaron and Beth and I are still having conversations about, um, you know, aspects of this project, which um, are relate to, for instance, parking at the community gardens. So, so that's, there's still some things to be determined on that, Beth. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. Um, right. We, we met the other day about it. Yeah. We need to still, figure out, you know, where that stockpile area is going to go. And then, right, we had talked about doing something more to the, um, to the west there, um, right along the fence line and having that be the stockpile area and having this project sort of harden that, which then that area would convert into the parking area once this project's over. Um, and, and we'll look at information. Yeah, we'll look at some of the, the the threshold or the challenge is really comp storage and this project that Beth described, the Fairing Brook project, will create a, a, a lot of co um, compensatory storage, right? Because you'll be excavating the bank, the accumulated bank there. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that in the next month or so. You said there were you were gonna your target submittal is when Beth middle of February or. Yeah, we're shooting for the first meeting in March. So now that I know that you have to submit three weeks ahead of time, <laughs> um, it, it's in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Okay, great. Just those couple of things. And we'll be doing quite a bit of outreach. Um, we're going to have to talk to folks on the school side. We'll be talking to some of the abutting landowners on the way in. There's still some access um issues that we need to clarify um so but it's exciting and stephanie is has been working on the community gardens and we are making progress on those as well in fact some raised bed gardens are being uh, uh fabricated in the next couple of weeks so exciting stuff happening yeah that's great um just on a note with, with brian yellen um cindy del papa so she's with 
uh, DER, we're partnering with her. She actually had reached out to a woman, Anna Martini, who works at Amherst College about just getting college kids involved in the Fearing Book Project. And Anna responded that she was working with Brian on what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so um, we're going to, Cindy and I are actually going to have a phone conversation with them tomorrow with Brian and Anna about the sampling that they want to do um, in the Fearing Brook. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know much about it. I'm not sure where along the Fearing Brook they're proposing to do it, but I think it's through Anna's hydrogeology class this spring. Um, so that could be great. Like you said, it could provide data before the project and after the project, and then also depending on where else along the brook they um, want to sample, it's just more more data on the Fearing Brook, which is really great. Yeah, and then as the, as the commission well knows, I mean, 2020 was not a good year for a lot of things, but it was not a good year for water quality in the Fort River. Um, and, you know, I would just put an asterisk near that because in my years with the town, last summer was the first time we were sampling and and really looking at the Fort River more closely. So I say that the water quality was not good in 2020, but I have no idea really what it was like prior to that because we weren't sampling. So, but what we did find is very high bacteria counts at particularly Jump Bridge at uh, Stanley Street, which is just downstream, not not very far from where the fearing meets the fort. So um, it's probably not a huge leap to say the fearing is a major contributor to, you know, um, some of the, the, certainly some of the more significant pollution in the fort. So anything we can do to clean up the fearing I think is a good thing. So more data, more data, and then we got to figure out how we address some of those issues. So jumping from that comment, the only thing, little piece I'd, I'd add is, so I think the water quality is is a really important thing to get a handle on, but to do that really well, you also have to monitor flow, like discharge the amount of water that's coming through the system. And what's super relevant here is the velocity of the water. So not only how much, but how fast is it going? Because the compensatory, compensatory storage or creating more floodplain storage, the idea is it slows down flow, you know? And so you have these hydric species that are saturated for longer periods of time, stronger bank, less erosion, less sediment in the system. You should have a grading sediments. So um, I, I'm happy to help in, in my capacity as a, you know, USGS hydrologist, if that makes any sense um, in any way. But that's one thing when you're looking at research plans for monitoring conditions before and after, that's one thing I would, like, it sounds so easy, but it's, it's not always easy. And sometimes I think it's looked over and then later you're like, wait, we have these discrete water quality samples, but you can't measure the loading, like the total amount, because you don't have the total amount of flow. Um, yeah, no, that, that's good to know, because I, I don't know what, what she's planning for her hydrogeology yeah. class. I know they're doing it this spring, which is a little, it doesn't match up quite with when we're doing our project, you know, yeah. our project is September, November, but still, if um, they can get some background, um, you know, the, I don't know what they're sampling for, but, and actually, you know, we, we did do, um, Malone and McBroom did a, a basis of design report for this project where they really did an in-depth look at hydrology and flows and all that. That's kind of what the sizing of the floodplain project is based on that study. But um, but I hear what you're saying in the next fall when it's happening, when we're doing the project or right after the project happens, if we can monitor changes in flow, you know, from the project that was created would would be really great. Maybe we can get another class to do more work next fall. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so then I had, I'm sorry, I dropped off for a second because my computer battery died. So I'm sorry if I like missed when we were talking about feedback on the specs and the plans, but just like two small thoughts, if, if I may. Sure. Um, one is the root wads, where are you guys get, did you say where you're going to get the root wads, like the big trees with root wads for those those in bank? Yeah, we're, we're going to try and reuse um, on site because we're doing so much clearing and there are yeah. big trees. So there, we're going to try to reuse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I was thinking about on that is that, so like, you know, climate change in New England, we're seeing more of both extremes, like more intense floods, but also more intense droughts. 
And one thing I notice when I look at those plans is that they look like they're real, they're really well designed for the high flows um, to reduce kind of shear forces on the bank, reduce erosion, slow flow, um, which is great. But we also have these periods, as you guys know, in the fearing, but increasingly kind of hydroclimatically of really, really low flow. So one thing I don't see in there is like a cross typical section that allows for kind of enough heterogeneity to have pool kind of ripple structure in the stream itself. Um, so that might be worth asking them, like if there's any plan for helping or like accelerating kind of armoring of the bank and things that would encourage habitat, you know, con con connected habitat at low flow. Um, because those root wads, chances are for most of the year will be high and dry, you know. Um, so, and then the other thing I was thinking along those lines is if you can use sycamores or there's like a few species of like our big floodplain trees that grow around here that will stump sprout. So not only will they have that really cool like structural integrity on the bank, they also will create more vegetation. So at low flow, you can have more shading over the stream. Um, so that's one thing to think about is like, look for um, London plains or sycamores or um, poplars will stump sprout a lot of them. Um, so it may be worth thinking about for when, when you're harvesting those big trees for the root wads. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if we have any sycamores out there. <laughs> yeah. I, we should. <laughs> yeah, I know up, I know um, downstream there are on the Fort River. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so yeah, like the low flow design there, I think is, um, I don't see it reflected in the plans that well. And I think it would be a good thing to think about. So you're, you're meaning in, in channel, in stream channel improvements. To, to I mean, I realize when I say that, it means it's, a, it's interpreted. I mean, if they're already going in for the random boulder clusters, then like, just make sure it's not going to end up in a situation where we fl slow down flow so much. It's just dropping a bunch of sand. And then at low flow, it's going to be one continuous, very, very low, <laughs> like very yeah. homogenous habitat situation. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, because we know in in the Fort River, there's you know a really healthy ecology in some places. So the chant, you know, the hope would be right that you, if you build it, they will come. Um, but in order to do that, you have to kind of establish kind of some heterogeneity of the bed form in Fearing Brook. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. And that the those guys will know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jim, yeah. Megan will know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Her. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sounds Excellent. good. Thank you. I just Anybody learned else? so much. Thank you, Jen. But that was like, it was a whole course. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody well, I can keep my computer battery working. <laughs> so is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on this? Okay. So anything else from the commission or do you have what you need? At this point, Beth, and you'll be um, formally submitting in a few weeks. Yeah, no, those were some great, great comments, and and sorry if I was a little vague with the presentation, but like I said, we're we're still sort of developing um, the narrative and and all yeah. the rest of it. So, but um, yeah, I just that would be helpful to share the plans and yep, good comments. Yep, and it's always great to see it before it's formally submitted. So that's great. Thank you. All right, yeah, and if anybody has any more uh, comments that they, they think of, feel free to email me. Sounds good. Thank you, Beth. All right, thanks. Have Bye -bye. a good night. Good night. Okay, Erin, what should we move on to? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to go in kind of a funky order, but I think uh, it'll just help us to move a little faster. Um, so I'd like to start with this emergency certification request. Um, this is a, a basically just under our bylaw. It was one tree in the buffer zone uh, located at 22 Hawthorne Road. They got a arborist out there. The tree was leaning over their home. Um, it's a really large tree and they um, requested to have it removed because it was a hazard to the house. So um, I got the go ahead from Dave that it's okay to issue and um, just looking for the board to ratify that order or that um, emergency certification. 
Okay, that makes sense. Um, I just want to also note that there are at least a couple people here who I think are here for can ab. So if we could hit that one soon too. Yeah, yeah, we can maybe jump to that one next. Okay. Okay, so, um, yep. And so they had that letter from the arborist. It looked like, yeah. Yeah, and I did condition it. They did um, spread some wood chips around the base of the tree, but it was all outside of the wetland. Um, and then there was some other trees that were blown down in the yard that were where the, um, the stumps were tipped up and they just cut the tree and the stumps fell back into place. So, but those ones were already dead and down. So it was just this one tree that they got approval for. Okay. That makes sense to me. I don't see any issues. Is anybody else? No, I was going to make the motion. Please ready to jump. Um, uh, I, rec I move that the Conservation Commission ratify the emergency certification at 22 Hawthorne Road. Seconded. Okay, Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Anna? Aye. And I. We are good on this one. Okay. All right, so, yeah. All right, so let's jump to enforcement. Um, so I'm, there's a couple enforcement updates, but um, there's, there's nothing substantive for me to share on Canton Ave. Really, uh, the board had basically kind of taken a no action stance on this one um, at the last meeting. And I mostly just added it as an administrative follow up because um, the order of conditions expires on February 23rd. And um, there was some back and forth about whether or not we should reach out to the landowner and condition that they need to make take some actions as far as the outstanding enforcement um, prior to that expiration date if they want a continuance or if we would again take a no action standpoint and just kind of um, not proceed with any communication until they reach a point of expiration. And okay. so I just wanted to follow up and make sure because, um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal to have it expire for them and then have to come back and refile. And also because um, there's been no action on the enforcement and um, that's also a big issue. I think we should stay the course. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with that as well. Um, yeah, and so I mean, I guess one thing will be what happens if there is no movement on the enforcement, though. Yeah, and I was going to actually recommend that if there is no action on the enforcement, that once the order of conditions expires on the 23rd, that we notify the landowner in writing that fining will begin if action is not taken by a certain date um, because we do have that authority under the local bylaw. Um, I believe it's fining up to $300 a day. And I just know for a fact that they could get a surveyor out there and, and start addressing this right now. And they're not. So. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yeah, we had no action last time. It sounds like we have no action again this time. Um, okay, so you guys want to just kind of cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay, that's totally fine by me. I know there's a couple um, abutters um, that have reached out to me since the last meeting and I see a couple of them on. I don't, I'm, I think they were just kind of wanting to be, you know, see if there was any updates, but I don't want to speak for them if. Yeah, so if anybody is on the call from the public who would like to speak, if you just raise your hand. And if there's nothing you want to say at this point, that's fine as well, obviously. Okay. Um, so I'm not hearing or seeing anything. So yeah, I think we are good on Canton Ave. Ready for the next one. Okay. So um, as, an, as a follow-up, there was um, some tree cutting that was reported on 562 South Pleasant Street. It's been a real um, task trying to get in touch with those folks. I, was I tried stopping by twice, knocking on the door. No one came to the door, even though those cars there. Then I finally was able to track down a phone number um, 
and I've left several messages and um, finally got a call back this afternoon. Hmm. Um, so I'll just kind of give a, an overview of the conversation. So first it was um, one of the owners that I spoke to and she denied that there had been any cutting on the site other than a hazard tree that had been removed last year. And I said, well, I was out on the property line where it meets the DPW barn and I did document several trees that had been cut in the wetland. And at that point I was turned over to the other homeowner who admitted that there was cutting. And they said, they were trying to improve the land and improve the aesthetics of the land. And um, they are, I don't believe English is their first language. So there was a little bit of a, you know, they're not, maybe not um, aware of the law um, in Massachusetts, perhaps. They, they did not know that there was any wetlands laws they the guy said basically oh i thought it was my property i could do whatever i wanted um and then kind of went on to say well can we fill in with some dirt can we do additional work and i was like absolutely not um i got his email address and basically said you can come forward with a plan to replant the trees that have been cut as an option or you can file an after the fact permit um and come before the CONCOM for, you know, because it sounds like they wanted to do more back there. Um, but I sent him um, all of the regulations. I sent him a list of consultants. Um, I, I think it was one of those situations where they maybe didn't know, but then when they got the letter from me, certified letter from me and also phone calls and follow-ups that they realized something, they had done something wrong. and. Um, so anyways, so I'm trying to work with them to, to resolve it without an enforcement order. Um, and I asked them to basically via email to provide, um, some comments to us by way of response. Let me just see what the date was on that. Um. Uh, the 5th of February. So I asked them to respond by February 5th via email with, are you filing a permit? Are you replanting? And if you are replanting, what species are you replanting and where? And I also requested a site visit once um, the snow is no longer on the ground. So that's an update on that one. Um, some of you may have seen um, the 214 Pomeroy, um, Pomeroy Lane. This is the poor farm property. Um, so you may recall at the last meeting, there was some talk about the deadlines. They did end up meeting the deadline, which is great for a submission of an initial plan. The initial restoration plan was basically replanting of blueberries in nothing but blueberries in the wetland and the riverfront area that had been cleared and grubbed. So my response back was basically, you know, planting a monoculture crop in resource areas um, for agricultural purposes by, <laughs> as a means of restoration is not going to work and that they had to come up with a more comprehensive plan with diverse species and, you know, overstory, understory. Um, and some, some herbaceous options as well, and that um, they could include blueberries in those plantings, but they couldn't just exclusively plant mm -hmm. a blueberry crop in there. So they agreed and they said they're coming back with revisions. So that's where that stands. Mm -hmm. And just double checking, oh, um, the CR for Dave, I think we need to look at. And other than that, I don't have any additional business. So let me pull that up. Okay. Yeah, and let me, so, so really, this isn't the CR itself, it's the assignment of the conservation restriction. So the, the conservation restriction, this is on a property, um, 
It's off of Southeast Street. It's not visible from Southeast Street, but it's a, a conservation restriction that was put into effect, uh, I think back in 2009. And essentially, let me just pull up one document here on my phone. Um, it is, um, give me one minute. So in essence, um, Kestrel is, they're transferring their assets from what they were before, which was a charitable trust, and they've become a nonprofit corporation. So this is really, um, nothing changes about the conservation restrictions. The town of Amherst through the conservation, through you, is a co-holder of the CR with the Kestrel Trust, formerly a charitable trust. Now that they've become a nonprofit corporation, they need to move their assets, an asset being an interest in land, which is a conservation restriction from the old charitable trust to the new nonprofit corporation. So in your packet were the official um, the official assignment of conservation restriction. And this really, it doesn't even really appear to need a vote. I mean, we could take a vote, but it's really authorizing Brett as chair to sign the assignment of conservation restriction from, for the town of Amherst. So that's, it's really a, a, a fairly minor legal document that we're gonna do once and never do again because they only become a nonprofit corporation once uh, from their former legal, uh, uh, legal, um, uh, they were a charitable trust. Now they're becoming a nonprofit corporation. So they have to do this with all of their CRs that they hold in any town, every town in, I think they have an 18 town um, focus area now, 18 or 19 towns. So nothing changes about the CR. The land is protected in perpetuity. It's just now protected by both the town of Amherst through the Conservation Commission and the Kestrel Trust as a nonprofit corporation. So Dave, a motion would be to authorize Brett to sign off on the assignment of conservation restriction. And I would, I would maybe put in the motion um, Assignment, yeah, exactly those words. And then assignment of conservation restriction for, um, you know, 1114 Southeast Street. And then we could insert in the motion later the, you know, the, uh, the book and page from the assignment sheet, uh, the uh, assignment itself, Aaron. Okay. So we would just need somebody to make that motion second and then authorize Brett to sign. And so, Dave, this all makes sense to me. It seems just like kind of paperworky type stuff. Um, is this like a, a real legal type document where it needs a pen and ink and a witness and all of that? I mean, it does say- we are, Yeah, we're gonna have to figure out how to do that, Brett, because it does need your signature uh, notarized. Okay. So we can figure that out. Um, my week is a little jammed tomorrow and Friday, but we can figure that out next week. I think we could do a socially distanced um, Notariz notarization with Angela Mills from my office. I've done it before. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, sounds good to me. So does anybody have any questions on this? By the way, this property is adjacent to McLeod Field. If you know where McLeod Field is off of Station Road. Um, you go down to the bottom of the hill on Station Road and you take the first trail on your right, you you head out and, and the big open field is McLeod Field and this is to the south of that. 
and uh, it's it's called the Johnson CR. And so the Johnsons and the McLeod, there's uh, family connections between them, and uh, they donated this CR to the town back in 2009, I think it was. Yeah, 2009 granted to Kestrel Trust in town of Amherst. There's the book and page, yeah, book 9874 and page 107. Does somebody want to make that motion or I think? 9874 and 107. So I could just, I could restate it and then somebody could say so moved if that's easier. Um, okay. I move okay. that we approve the uh, chair of the Conservation Commission signature for assignment of conservation constriction um, of uh, the CR at uh, Station Road, something, 1114 one, one, Southeast Street. That's book 13570, page, oh, book 9874, page 107. Uh, what else? For the Johnson CR? Yeah. For the Johnson CR. <clears throat> Basically, we approve Brett, the chair of the Conservation Commission, signing this document. Second. Second. Oh, you got it. Sorry. Sorry. OK, thank you. So Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. And I assume I'm allowed to vote on this? Aye. So I'm authorizing myself. I don't know. So okay. So I think we're good. And so Dave, yeah, if we can just be in touch to figure out um, when I can meet up with Angela. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Are we good for the night? So that is all I have. Okay. So looking for a final motion. Move to adjourn. There we go. Second. I got the second. That's fine. <laughs> I will settle for a second. <laughs> Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Anna? Aye. And I for myself. So we are officially adjourned. And Aaron, we probably won't see you next time. So have fun. Enjoy. Right, good luck. Good luck, Aaron. But this way, I hope you don't see me next time. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you a couple of weeks ago, so if we see you next time, oof. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Is Stephanie, we'll see Stephanie in two weeks. I will be there. Thanks, Excellent. Bye, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye, all. Bye, guys. Take care. <laughs>